comp line found printed there in your bulletin this evening. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To the same praise to your name, O Most High. To herald your love in the morning. Your truth at the close of the day. Let us then confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. <laughs> Holy and gracious God, I, I confess, confess that I have sinned against you this day. Son of my sin, I know the, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed. But some are known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask forgiveness. Deliver and restore me, that I may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. We rest now in his peace and rise in the morning to serve him. Amen. Amen. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, because you hate nothing you have made, and forgive the sins of all who are penitent, create in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily repenting of our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let me see then for a reading. The epistle reading that is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter. Paul writes, The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I'd like the congregation to please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel, then, according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter, and this reading will form the basis, the text of our sermon here this evening. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him. John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. 
And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. It'd be seated then as we sing our hymn of the day, hymn 425, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Thanksgiving dinner, 
Chat with a college professor. Talk to some of your friends. Who's Jesus? Well, you'll find out there's plenty of answers to be found. Some are going to be baseless. Others will be outright blasphemous. A few may be somewhat on target, but most of the answers you'll hear will probably be out there in left field somewhere. Sad to say, but hardly anyone will hit upon the heart and center of who Jesus really is and what he's come to do. Well, once again, we find ourselves on the race course here tonight. We're on the road. We're on, we're on the race to the cross. But it kind of seems like we veered way off course. It's kind of like our GPS is busted here tonight. If you look at a map, Jerusalem and the cross, way down here in the south, but where are we at on the map? We're way up here in the north. We're, we're, we're way up here in Gentile country. In fact, we're probably the farthest spot, the farthest north that Jesus ever went in his ministry. We are way beyond the comfort zone of many Jews. And yet, here we are tonight, traveling along with Jesus on his way to the cross. And it's right here that Jesus decides to ask his disciples the crucial question. Right here at the halfway point of Mark's gospel. And you have to remember this, we've been talking about in Bible study on Sunday mornings. This is the whole main point of Mark's gospel. He's going to tell us, number one, who Jesus is, and number two, what he's come to do. And so Jesus pops the question. Who do people out there say that I am? And like us, the people had all sorts of answers. They said all kinds of stuff. They had, they had all sorts of opinions, and like most of us, they were pretty free with them. They were very eager to share them. Some said this, and others, now they said that. And so that's why Jesus gets pretty blunt here tonight. He turns to the disciples, looks them right in the eye, and he says, okay, that's great, that's what the people out there say, but now I'm going to ask you, who do you say that I am? Peter answers, and he answers pretty well. He speaks the truth, he confessed. Peter spoke for the whole entire Christian church. That is, he gives the answer that the church is tasked to give, to confess. For it is upon this confession of Peter that the church is built. For Peter answers, you are the Christ. Who is Jesus? He's the one, the Messiah, the Savior, he who saves, our only hope, the long promise, who has now come. Well, that a boy, Peter. Good job. Good for you. It's actually good for us. For this is actually the very heart, the center, the core of the Christian faith. This is actually the life of the world. But then all of a sudden, Jesus just drops a bomb on the whole thing. He tells them not to say a word to anyone. Why? It's because the cross still looms. The race has to go on. As he says here tonight, he has to be rejected, actually by the church. He must suffer. He must be killed. And yes, three days later, he, he would rise again, but you've got to process all that other stuff before you can even begin to look at the resurrection. Jesus doesn't hold anything back here tonight. He just speaks boldly. He speaks plainly. He says, all of this, guys, is going to take place, period. End of story. <clears throat> but not if Peter, not if Peter can help. He didn't like it. Not one bit. No siree. He thinks this whole race to the cross stuff should be shut down right here, right now. But that would have been a terrible mistake because then everybody would have went to hell. 
That's why we all, whether we like it or not, we have to urge Jesus to finish the race. Keep on going, Jesus. Suffer, die for us. That's the point of the race. In fact, that's the ultimate point of the Christ's life. Why the race? Why the race to the cross? The answer? If Jesus doesn't run it, well, then you're going to have to run it all by your lonesome. The wages of sin is death. Somebody's got to pay for this sin, for this rebellion against God. And as we're finding out in Mark's Gospel on Sunday morning, sin is an inside job. Making some outside changes, you know, some cosmetic changes, some behavioral modifications here and there, that's just not going to cut it. An outside remodeling project isn't going to fix what's wrong inside here. It would be like putting some lipstick makeup, and some nice clothes on a corpse. The corpse looks nice, but the guy's still dead. Somebody's, somebody's going to have to fix the problem. And we find out here tonight who Jesus is. He's the Christ, and then we find out why the Christ has come. He's come to face God's wrath. He's come to face hell. He's come to face eternal death for you so that you don't have to. Nevertheless, though, Peter still doesn't like it. He actually puts up a big protest. He says, Lord, I, I just don't get this because there has to be a better way to pull this whole thing off. But Jesus says, hey, you're, you're, you're thinking about God, Peter. It's just totally way off base. It's, it's, it's way too human. God doesn't operate on our terms. It's kind of like what Paul said in our first reading here tonight. Your, our, our thinking is, is, is just not the way we would do it, this cross thing. But Paul says the foolishness of God is, is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Salvation doesn't operate according to our standards. That's why Paul says here tonight, the cross thing is, is a total stumbling block. It's not something that we would have come up with in a thousand years. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And Peter had to learn that. And he had to keep learning it all the way throughout his life. Through prayer, through meditation on the scriptures, and then through his own trials and temptations all the way to his own cross where he was crucified upside down because he considered himself unworthy to be crucified right side up like his Savior. And we have to keep learning it as well in the very same way. Through prayer, meditation on the scriptures, and through many trials, tribulations, and temptations. You see, Jesus doesn't call us down a path that's easy either. It's a path to the cross. It's a path through the cross. It's a path in life that's marked actually by many crosses. He doesn't hide that from us. He, he tells us very plainly. What does he say tonight? If anyone would come after me, anyone, that's everybody. If you're going to follow Jesus, if anyone would come after me, he's going to have to deny himself and do what? Take up his cross and follow me. It's not just for the disciples. It's not just for Levi and the rest of the sinners that we encountered last week. No, this is for everyone, for all of us. You're called now to follow Jesus on this race to the cross. For Jesus says, for whoever would save his life, that would be not to go on this journey to the cross with him. You'll lose it. But whoever loses his life, whoever goes on this journey to the cross with him, for my sake and for the gospel, will save it. 
For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? Or what can a man pay in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, and what are those words? The words that he just spoke. Those cross words. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with all of his holy angels. You see, here is the big take-home point of tonight. Just because you are a Christian doesn't mean that you get to avoid the cross. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you get to avoid suffering, pain, and death. No, what we find out here tonight, it's exactly the opposite. Because you are a Christian, you get put on the road that leads to the cross. You're put on the road to the cross with Christ so that you can die with Christ and then live with Christ. You will encounter trials, tribulations, temptations, suffering, pain, and death because you are a Christian. But you will conquer because Christ ran the perfect race to the cross ahead of you. Because remember, you're following Him. He's ran the perfect race for you. He went ahead of you. You see, it is most certainly true. This cross thing, as Paul tells us here tonight in 1 Corinthians, it's a very troubling thing. It was for Paul. It was for Peter. And it is for all of us here tonight as well. Just as Peter struggled to wrap his mind around this whole thing, so will you. It's a hard message. The gospel always is. But the gospel is also unshakable. God's promise is true, even in the darkness. Even in the valley of the shadow of death. Even at the cross. Even when the Christ dies. Even when you die. What can we say in response to all the things that we've heard here tonight? We can say we know that God loves us because He set His Son on the road to the cross. We know that nothing, even the crosses that we'll bear in this life, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ. Paul says in Romans 8, No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who's actually loved us. For he says, I am convinced, I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's found where? In the Christ. Christ Jesus our Lord. This we must remember, my friends. Jesus is the cross. The Christ came for the cross. And the Christian, the follower of Christ, will go through the cross of Christ in order that they might wear his crown. Forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds and faith in Christ Jesus into life everlasting. Amen. I invite the congregation then to please stand as we confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and 
sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. In righteousness I shall see you. When I wait, your, your presence, presence will be in joy. Be present, merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of life may find our rest in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 O Lord, support us all the day long of this troubled life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed. The fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all the perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and drive from them all the snares of the enemy. Let your holy angels dwell with us to preserve us in peace. And let your blessing be on us always. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Abide with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us at the end of the day, at the end of our life, at the end of the world. Abide with us with your grace and goodness, with your holy word and sacrament, with your strength and blessing. Abide with us when the night of temptation comes upon us. Abide with us and with all the faithful, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Taught by our Lord in trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for announcements. Welcome everyone here this evening once again in the name of the Lord as we've, we've reached the midpoint here very quickly of Mark's Gospel. Mark's got 16 chapters. We're in Mark 8. This is, this is the center. Go all the way to the north now. And now this is the turning point of Mark's Gospel. Where now he sets his face like a runner towards Jerusalem. And it's basically a sprint. It's a mad dash now in Mark's Gospel to get Jesus to the cross as quickly as we can. And so now we're kind of on the downhill as now Jesus is going to be sprinting to Jerusalem. He's going to encounter a couple of people on his way to the cross over the next couple of weeks. And we're going to continue this journey all the way to Monday, Thursday in the Upper Room, to Good Friday, and then to Easter Sunday. We're going to stay in Mark's Gospel all the way through. And so we'll, we'll kind of get this theme of, of, of Mark's purpose, of what he's trying to get across to us, of who Jesus is. He truly is the Christ, and what he's come to do for us. And then in the end, what does that all mean for us? And we're already beginning to unpack that as we did here tonight, that Jesus Christ came for us to go to the cross so that now we might wear the crown forever, which will lead us ultimately to Easter Sunday. So a couple quick announcements here tonight. First of all, thanks again to everybody who came to the meal, uh, those who prepared food, served, cleaned up. Uh, Sign-up sheets, once again, are, are out there on the bulletin board. We'll continue here next week, same time, same place, 6 o'clock to eat, 7 o'clock for worship as we continue here this race to Good Friday and ultimately here to Easter Sunday to the open tomb. So we invite you to come back and, and be here uh, for that on uh, next Wednesday. And then we'll continue with our worship services here as we invite you to be here on Sunday as we continue to learn more about who Jesus is and what he's come to do for us. So have a good rest of your evening. Have a good rest of your week here. Enjoy the weather in the name of the Lord. Look forward to seeing you here next week. 
And we'll conclude our worship then here tonight with our closing hymn, 428, Cross of Jesus, Cross of Solomon. Thank you.